And uh, we are going to finish phase two this year. God has assigned us phase one as the day we finish. And we join him at the end of phase one. That's when uh, at first the prophet was all alone. Praise the Lord. And, uh, and we join him at the end of phase one. That was in Madaba last year. And uh, phase two, uh, many of us have begun to join him. Join the prophet, his National Geographic is back with us. <laughs> and uh, then uh, phase three, uh, also some of us going to join. And um, during phase one, phase two, and phase three, uh, I was shown in A.S. Rock that things are still wet cement. Now, we use the illustration, dry cement means nothing else can be done. Wet cement means you still can mold it. Adjust the shape before it dries. Once it dries, you can't readjust the shape. And we're talking about wet cement, dry cement, in terms of the spiritual dimension. And, uh, and in terms of the wet cement, things are still very dynamic in the realm of the spirit. Because God is allowing. Now, when I say that it's still wet cement, not everything is wet cement. Some things are a really dry cement. Some things in the lives, your angels, the origin, the calls that have been given in your life, sealed. Some things are really sealed. And some things once sealed and given, God irrevocably doesn't take back. For the gifts and the callings of God are without repentance. They're irrevocable. And God Himself honors that. Angels honor that. But remember that when we are not faithful to what God has given, God will keep His word but reduce the fulfillment of it. An example of that is um, David. When God says that He will build him a house, God kept his promise that there was always a descendant of David on the throne. But when David's descendant disobeyed him, disobeyed God, God started cutting them. Until after Solomon's time, when Solomon did not obey God, by the time he passed the empire to his son, it was cut down uh, by ten parts out of twelve. And God still kept his word. But there is a human element that needs to fulfill. Even after third phase, when it's all dry cement, your faithfulness is still important. We still have free choice. And after it's dry cement, when you already have the callings and the giftings of God assigned by angels and the Holy Spirit upon your life, if you're not faithful to it, someone else will take that destiny. If you're faithful 80%, 20% will be taken and passed on to someone. If you only are faithful 20%, 80% of it will be taken and passed on to someone. Even after it's dry cement. But something is precious in phase 2 and phase 3 that is still to be completed. And that is, the dynamics is that God is looking for people. And one of the reasons that Lord showed me that phase 2 and phase 3 while is still going on is a testing period. It's a test for every single one. And the plastic tree may be allowed to test some of you in certain manners, but every single one is being tested. Under phase three is over. It is still wet cement in some things. Your life is being watched. Everything that you respond to is being recorded as to how the dynamics are going to flow in your life. And uh, one of the things that has happened kind of uh, from Hong Kong, your, your family, 
is when you make the decision and you've been online for a long time when you make the decision to come about all during the time when you make the decision because it's still wet cement the dynamics in the spring began changing and God assigned you an angel and because your heart responds to God in the correct way even as things are shared with you the dynamics begin to change why is it so wet cement at the moment we have asked from God from the exodus of 10 million increase to 33 million increase to 50 million so everyone who responds God now decides and is choosing leaders and how you're going to respond to God in this year and in the next year is going to determine your spiritual position for the rest of this end time. So this year and the next year, I recommend a lot of fasting, a lot of prayer, a lot of absorbing. Because if you do not absorb well, you do not respond well, when God might be deciding to give you 10 gifts, He might cut you down to 5 gifts. And originally this extra 5 that was, could have been yours, taken and given to somebody else. At the end of the day, once the semen dries, you can cry your heart out, you cannot get another 5. Because once it's given to somebody else, it cannot be taken back. If the other person who receives it is faithful. So remember the dynamics of phase 2 and phase 3. Very important. Once we finish the last altar of phase 3, heaven is shut. The what you want from God. So if you ever want to hunger for God, ever want to thirst after God, these are the dynamics now that as one responds to God and God tests in innumerable ways small little things of faithfulness just as God can give God can also take that is why God is just asking when the disciples of Jesus were following Jesus Jesus did not immediately chose the twelve. He let them follow for some time. But there came a time when he had to choose the twelve. There was a possibility that some of the original twelve might not make it. But thank God, all of those who need to make it, made it. But then there was a second tier, as you know, the seventy who also make it true. And so it doesn't mean that when somebody has a job that another person who could have also taken a job is left aside. They will still be doing at the side of the other original person. So that at any time if the first guy fails, falls upon the second guy. God always have a backup plan. You can be sure. If we humans know how to back up the hard disk, back up our data, back up things, God's backup plan is more sophisticated. It involves humans and his backup plan is fantastic. And so understand these dynamics that are going on uh, in this time and how we respond uh, to God. And I hope to touch a little bit on that uh, just before we go into prayer. As we continue on this series uh, on the rapture, we got all the facts. Are we sharing? Okay, we got all of them. Okay, thank you very much. So let's continue where we left off, and I'll touch more on that in application to what we are sharing today. And uh, in the rapture series, we start with um, the uh, the timeline, and as you look into the timeline. Let's uh, welcome the Holy Spirit 
and uh, thank you, thank God for all the angels that are also working in our midst. And uh, let's pause for a moment and acknowledge our Father. Father, we acknowledge you as always. We acknowledge your grace. We acknowledge your throne. We acknowledge you rule over all of us. And Father God of our Lord Jesus Christ. We ask that you continue to glorify yourself in these end times as division and distribution of gifts are made. Upon each one of us, assignments given. We ask, so, Father God, that you will establish your word. This word that we take to heart, we take not lightly. This word that we hear from the seven thunders prophet this word that we receive from heaven above we take not lightly this word that we receive from the appointment that you have appointed in this call that you have of the apostle to lead this new testament church we take not lightly we tremble at your word we tremble at your word we tremble at your command. We are so, Father God, that once again you take our hearts and our minds captive. Establish the gifts, the callings, the anointings that have begun to germinate in each one of our lives. Let these words that are spoken by the power of your Spirit these words that come from your throne, these words of your Holy Spirit delivered from the heart of our Lord Jesus. Let these words establish our hearts and our minds in you. Strengthen the angels assigned with us in these words. And Father, let your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Let your kingdom be established. Let nothing fail of your word and your assignments to your people. Thank you, Father. Establish your word. Glorify your Son, Jesus, in our midst again. Cause our hearts and our lives and our minds to yield to your Lordship. And as your word is spoken, we humble ourselves before your word. For your word has first place in our life. We can do nothing without you, Jesus. Manifest yourself in our midst, Master. Savior and Lord. Reveal yourself to our hearts. Whisper your love deep within our being. Establish each one of us that we may be rooted, grounded upon your love and your word. Thank you for your word. Thank you for your Holy Spirit. Open our hearts, our minds, our soul to understand, to comprehend your assignments upon us. Let your word pierce us like a two-edged sword, cutting asunder soul and spirit, bone and marrow, discern the intents of our heart. May your glory once again, Father, shine on our lives. Let the light of heaven light up this place as we deal with end time things. Let your light go forth to all who hear your word. Thank you, Father. We glorify you. We glorify you. We glorify you and be magnified in 
Jesus' name. Amen. We have the timeline. And we have been going uh, seven years at a time from the time of the seven Panthers on November 14, 2000, uh, 2012. We have covered the first two seven plus seven years. We have touched on that. Last week, or two weeks ago, uh, last week, well done, those of you who have uh, uh, come, continue to pray. And uh, two weeks ago, we mentioned about uh, the third group of seven years. Uh, and the third group of seven years start 2027. And we say that from 2027 onwards, it's all war. It's almost a decade of war. Because at the end of this decade, with just a few years of, of uh, fragile peace before the fourth group, and uh, we, we bring it further down uh, so that we can see more. Yes. So we put this uh, uh, 2027 all the way down. Uh, we see war after war, until right up to 2034. 2030, 2000, all these wars that we mentioned about, which I won't go through again, because uh, then it's only a short, fragile few years of peace, roughly around 2030, 2034. Before in 2034, the fourth group of seven years, war breaks out between China and Russia, and that lasted very short, and uh, uh, before the world settles again into. Uh, another period of peace and uh, so if you add the seven years before and these first few years it's almost a decade of war from 2027 onwards and uh, so we hold this aside for a moment uh, one of the signals that we have in 2027 uh, in the midst of it as we see things happening uh, in a war as uh, the United States intervene in Spain and it stirs up the world against them and uh, Europe got stirred up, China got stirred up, the world gets stirred up and internal uh, uh, problems within the United States and uh, different things take place we have uh, and then we will show that uh, uh, in the midst of the war that takes place somewhere in 2027, perhaps in the latter part, uh, then uh, the two fallen angels are released. And then we show the meteorite things. Yes. Okay. And also, we also show the little piece of right up on the meteorite. Um, where? Yes. 2027, I read again to you. And uh, we just reduce it and okay, here so we can see all the words. Uh, more of the screen, yeah. Thank you. Yes, so 2027, and uh, in the midst of the war between uh, Europe and US and China, and uh, there's a meteorite that takes place about 2027 and uh, uh, the timing of the meteorite coming in was just before the European war against Russia and uh, so that's uh, after uh, Europe has won against uh, China and then it's about to move towards uh, Russia just before that and uh, the meteorite takes a meteorite came and uh, just a couple of weeks or so ago, uh, there was a meteorite that hit uh, Russia. And uh, you saw it in the news. And apparently that satellite, uh, that meteorite was from the left to the right. Uh, and this one is from the right to the, to the left. And uh, hitting. And uh, this one uh, hit several places. Uh, they are, it might have been one big meteorite broken into seven pieces, two large pieces, but five smaller pieces. The two large pieces uh, roughly uh, explode, and the size of the explosion uh, is in megaton capacity. It's like the explosion of a nuclear bomb. 
except that it uh, doesn't have as much radiation. And uh, with the two explosions, uh, there are five sm smaller explosions. And uh, the two main areas, uh, as we mentioned, uh, Kanti, Mansilis, and Nenfi, uh, Nefti, Ugansk, uh, both under the autonomous district of Kantia Mansia, uh, where, 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 where the two main explosions were. Five of the smaller ones landed in Kazakhstan near the border of Russia uh, in the area of uh, Karingandi, Ukraine in the area of Dnipropetrovsk, and uh, then near St. Petersburg uh, towards the area of Warlock there, uh, near Moscow, uh, Vladimir, and also the fifth one in the region of Perm. And the two big explosions destroyed the city completely. Thank you. And we can close that file now. Now we look at the place on the map. I'm going to move it slightly to the right because there's one red one here. So these are the rough regions in uh, uh, Russia where the two main explosions are there. And these are where the two fallen angels. One fallen angel who specializes in sorcery. One fallen angel who uh, uh, who specializes in seduction, and uh, when the two meteorites hit in 2027, they're gonna hit these two places. It doesn't David saw it coming from the right, hitting this place, followed by five small pieces that hit in these regions here, and uh, it destroyed these uh, the two cities that are here nearby, and at the same time. It releases the two fallen angels. One of the fallen angels will go towards Turkey, and from thus forward, Turkey will become pro Russia. One of the other fallen angels will go towards Saudi and uh, for some time, and then afterward, uh, he will go and join the false prophet in South Africa. And uh, so we can see that the, the false prophet this year is 2013, is about nine years old. And uh, so we can see that we are already in the end time. By uh, the time we finish third phase, when things have been sealed in the spirit. See, it's very important what we are doing phase two, phase three. It is sealing some things in the spiritual dimension. Once they are sealed, and fix and the cement is dry, then only the beast is born. He's not allowed to come. Uh, the Antichrist, which is the other beast. Uh, so there's a beast on the land, beast on the sea. So the Antichrist, the other beast, is born. And uh, so what we are doing, even though it may look so, so simple, putting stones together to build an altar in various places of the world. To the spiritual realm is very significant. It's so simple for us humans, of course, there's some effort involved. But it's very big in the spiritual dimension. And uh, when we were in A.S. Rock, uh, during the first day, uh, we were going to some places, and, and Pastor David was observing. And as he observed, he observed the angels observing us. <laughs> So he was observing the observing angels. Uh, and they were just watching, observing us. Until, uh, as we look around, uh, and looking for places to build an altar, and uh, then we finally decided on a certain place, and uh, then we were thinking of coming back the next uh, day in the morning, but uh, and we make a quick decision to uh, build an altar on the spot because uh, uh, it was it's, you know, Pastor David looking around, okay, there's nobody around and say, uh, let's do it now and then when I responded, uh, yes, uh, when the two of us agreed and the prophet apostle agreed, it was sealed the, the angel, uh, he heard, Pastor David heard when the angel say something like yeah, something like that. Yeah, yeah. Okay. And so he later asked me, 
Uh, did I say anything? Uh, the only thing I said was yes. <laughs> and, uh, and, and in a soft way. So he heard a yell. Yeah! And uh, like, it was like the angels were waiting a whole day for us. And uh, waiting for us to do a simple thing like build an altar. And uh, once the altar was built, something was seen. Something was seen. Uh, the archangel over Australia uh, showed his power and and uh, and uh, it was like uh, 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 there was there, there was like a shift in the in the dimension of the spirit and uh, it was like he, he has been waiting there for millions of years since the fall of Satan and uh, saw the history of mankind waiting and from the day a tiny little group of humans, four of us, on the day the four tiny little humans and saved by the grace of God, just walking around, build a simple altar, something powerful was still in the spirit. So don't underestimate the little things that God asks us to do. And if it tells you to during these two years to fast at a certain thing, do it. If it tells you to pray, do it. Uh, there's some things that can determine whether by next year, September, when we finish everything, whether you end up as a 10 talent person or a 2 talent person. These two years are very critical to how you obey God. And that obedience is uh, precipitated, not necessary that you have to go and travel and build the altar. Because that is a sign for different different people with the qualifications. And uh, it includes even those of you who didn't go to build altars. You being part of the church here. It includes those who in Australia being part of the church there who are not, I know many of you are not going to travel and build the altars. It includes your destinies. You are being tested and watch these two years. This year and next year. And the little decisions you make could seal your destiny, become dry cement. And after that, for the next 50, 60 years, you're locked into that. And after next year, you want to cry, your fast 80 days also cannot change. God, I say, I'm sorry, you only got two talents. You should have done your fasting earlier. And you should have done your desire and obedience earlier. Remember, very critical. So some of these things that are about to take place, 2027, that were, uh, when this thing happens in Russia, because it happens in wartime, Europe has a has some sort of a ruler spirit that try to stir up the whole of Europe to unite themselves. Because when Europe went against US and China, it begins more and more powerful. And uh, it begins to arise and it wants to also swallow up every European nation that was formerly under the Soviet Union. And when they want to become bigger and bigger, that's when Russia reacts. And that's when they have to fight the war with Russia. And because Russia is not going to let go their former Soviet Union uh, uh, countries that were under their influence. And as a result, that war result took place in Russia. And they dare not attack Russia under this event. When this event happens, led by France, Germany, and England that attacked Russia. They will succeed for some time and enter even and conquer Moscow. Russia will retreat like they have done uh, under Napoleon Bonaparte and in the Second World War when Hitler went against them. They will do it the third time. And, uh, but then, like before, they will counter attack. And when they counter-attack, they will succeed in attacking back Europe. And, uh, and they will be winning 
in the end, as they began to win against England, against France and Germany, leading all the rest of Europe, as they began to win against them, another major event takes place. Just as the three European countries are going to sign for peace, and before they were completely defeated, uh, you will have the major tsunami, which we talked about in 2029. That's where we show when the tsunami takes place. And, and this time we draw the scale out uh, according to the dimensions. And uh, we took the same longitude latitude with a curve at this point. And you can see the size of the earth movement is huge. At its epicenter, it will be 300 meters tall. The last recent tsunami in Japan was 10 to 12 meters high. This is 300 meters tall. It's about 100 story building. By the time it reached some countries here, uh, it might be 100, 150 stories tall, 100, 150 meters tall, about 30 to 50 stories. But it's still destructive. So somewhere in 2029, this major event, you can see how big it is, is going to totally destroy Philippines. Totally destroy Hong Kong. It's going to totally destroy a lot of regions near the coast, parts of Japan, uh, parts of Korea. And, and, and in Korea, during the destruction time, Pastor David saw underground pipes bursting and all those destruction. South Korea was destroyed. And uh, uh, Singapore is also gone. You all have 16 more years to enjoy this country. And uh, then, uh, now it's 2013. And then you have uh, all the uh, east coast of Malaysia affected. And some other places here, we just didn't have time to draw all the small things that happened. But if all these small islands are gone, swallowed up. And uh, the destruction is so great. And of course, the other side, it reaches the west coast of the United States and the upper part of uh, South America, those Colombia area, uh, in about a day. So they have a bit more response time. But, uh, uh, and so it's going to affect uh, parts of it. And all this is gone. It's so great, it's impact that after the aftermath, North and South America are no more connected. The sea end up about 15 to 18 feet higher. And you will have two big islands. And the earth will also move in such a manner that, uh, and whatever impact. Now, from the geographical point of view, National Geographic Society, <laughs> from the geographical point of view, <laughs> it is possible that the impact of the satellites could slowly move upon the earth. Because that's 2027, could be towards the end or whatever. And uh, then it sit in, and then it slowly begin to affect the crust, and resulted in a tsunami. It could be linked, the two events could be linked, because it's already very unstable. Not only will the tsunami take place, the earth will move so that some parts go lower, some land, land mass go lower because of the movement uh, if you think that sinkholes appear here and there, this is whole countries disappearing. The whole of England disappear underwater. And uh, then another place towards Australia and New Zealand, but new land appear. So there's going to be earth movements. And those earth movements might come after the tsunami. And uh, so these like, things begin to impact uh, on this planet. Uh, these are the major uh, events uh, that we talked about uh, two weeks ago when we talked about uh, the events of the third seven years. Counting seven, 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 seven years and, uh, uh, from the time of the prophecy of the seven thunders on November 14, 2012. So we count seven years, seven years. The third seven years during wartime, all these things are going to take place. 
And uh, so let's go back to this uh, deadline here. So we know that there's the fall of US, the two fallen angels released. Now we know the exact happening, the meteorite taking place. Now, those of you hearing this prophecy, uh, you either you either get it right or you completely miss it. This is no guessing game. These are things that are gathered for visions and downloads. And uh, these are not uh, guessing games at all. We give it exact event. We even tell you exactly where the meteorite can hit. Let me tell you, even the best scientists cannot calculate where they will hit. Even when, when a human-made object is about to fall, they can only give estimates. These are very precise things that uh, uh, you either get it right or you get it wrong. Let me tell you, this is from the Lord. And these are given early and we're given at once notice so that nobody can say. Now you might say, okay, we're still a small group going forth. Oh, this, this before this thing happened, between 2022 to 2026, the church will experience super growth. By that time, we were all radio stations, TV station. This message and this that you hear will definitely be broadcast to the whole world. The whole world, including the non-Christian world, will have a chance to hear so that no one can say, God did not speak. You are blessed to be able to hear this early and prepare yourselves. And so, these events are going to take place and then uh, 2027 to 2029 is a war between England, France, Germany, with Russia and it's not easy to win a war over Russia, that's why it prolongs to 2029. And uh, where is the other war, China, US, EA, and Europe, that one finished quite fast. And it's more a naval battle that take place. And uh, then, uh, we see here again, 2028, England, Germany, France enter uh, war with Russia. Within a year, the war started. Within a year, the war started in 2027, occupied for a few months, and then Russia come back and back. And uh, then let's look over here, 2029, things were happening. And uh, then, uh, as all these uh, uh, forces are attacking, we mentioned that. Uh, uh, while all this uh, European war with Russia was taking place, and uh, then we will also be together with that. And let's look. Uh, uh, there's this tsunami that takes place. And uh, let's look lower. Okay, uh, the tsunami that destroyed all these places. And uh, there is also war in South America. We saw it, uh, two weeks ago. And a war in Africa, and uh, so there are also uh, wars in the Middle East, and we talk about how there are two nuclear explosions in the Middle East. So two man-made nuclear explosions in a Middle Eastern country, and uh, we know uh, uh, which country they are. We won't tell now. We'll tell later. And uh, you can imagine a uh, meteorites coming down, nuclear explosions, and uh, tsunami. It is. A horrible seven years in the third seven years and it settled into some fragile calm and uh, a lot of people die in the tsunami but many more die after the tsunami due to sickness disease and, uh, and uh, without human cultivation or human care uh, animals run wild it's so horrible that uh, during the A.S. Rock, Pastor David has another vision of the post-tsunami. And it was given in uh, vision form. And the vision form was, he saw uh, some sort of Kelong. Uh, Kelong, for those of you who are in the Western countries, is some sort of a structure that is built in the sea with wood. And uh, it stands a certain height above the water, like a, a wooden platform above the water where they build a little hut. And uh, they use it for fishing. And uh, uh, the Asians call it a Kelong. And uh, so he saw that uh, the water was way high above. That at the end, in the end, the ocean level with the melting of the snow and everything, ocean levels rise 15 to 18 feet higher. And that would be the normal level. 
uh, in most places. Even even that is enough to destroy many islands and countries. And uh, and uh, in that vision, the pastor David saw rats, fierce rats, animals representing animals, uh, and the rest were so fierce that in the vision it beat him also. Bitten by a fierce rat. And of course the prophet got very angry. How dare you bite me? And squeeze and kill the rat. But uh, vision can kill rats. Huh? Yes. And uh, it must be a dynamic vision. And uh, a virtual reality. <laughs> yeah. And uh, so uh, that represents wild animals. Running wild where humans uh, cannot control anymore. Uh, animals increase and they, they, the nature was rebelling. And more people die of sickness and diseases and famines that result after the tsunami. And these are major world events that take place during the third seven years. And two weeks ago, we covered the third seven years. But let's today move forward and cover the fourth seven year, which is from 2034. 2034, the fourth seven years, from 2034 to 2041. There will be a major war. You know, towards the end of the third, third, uh, third, Seven years, Russia was very really strong. China was also growing really strong, and uh, then they both grow stronger and stronger under 2034. In the fourth seven years, a major war breaks up between China and Russia, and there's a quick, a very quick war, and uh, it's not so much that they fought directly. But they were fighting for territories, control of the earth. Because US is gone. US becomes a place of militia. Uh, the 50 states are all broken up. And uh, uh, a lot of uh, famine, a lot of uh, uh, things happen. Uh, all those breakdowns already took place from 2027. And you can imagine all the devastation. It cannot exist as a country anymore. The world is a different world. And so Russia grows strong, China grows strong, there is a war between them and, uh, and they are grabbing territories and there was some confrontation. During the war, Russia takes over half of Mongolia and they were coming down against China. China quickly signed for peace. And so then the world will look like what you saw in the Seven Thunders. Now we show the Seven Thunders map. During the fourth seven years, and remember, the world map also will look different because uh, we are only using a world map that we have now. Uh, parts of all these middle areas are gone. These will be two big islands. Parts of uh, West uh, US is gone, and uh, parts of upper part here all disappear. And uh, the land shape all might look different. Australia here will be the more land appear here, more land appear in. New Zealand, and then uh, uh, Singapore is gone, uh, Philippines is gone, parts of Japan is gone. So uh, we are just using an old map and uh, superimpose what the rough territory where in the fourth seven years, then you have this uh, seven thunders picture where the world is divided between Russia and China. But there are safe havens, safe zones. And the safe zones are Australia, New Zealand, and uh, then there will be parts of uh, Canada that we know is going to be. Those green areas that we build, except now this green area is bigger. It's bigger. This thing is very small now. We have in Ayers Rock enlarged it. And this is very big now. And uh, so this place is going to be as large, a huge place to take uh, at least about 20 million people. Uh, and then uh, there will be a safe zone in uh, here, Brazil too. 
And then there's a safe zone in Ethiopia. Somewhere Ethiopia is close to this side. And uh, so there are some safe zones that are there. And you notice the where is marked in red is where uh, we are building the altars. And not every place that we build the altar is a safe zone. Just to remind you. And uh, we have an altar here. And uh, when we shift, we will shift this altar. Also, this whole altar will be shifted. But I want this special permission because you cannot take stones into Australia. We have to specially declare them. And uh, so, uh, but uh, uh, some places like Seoul, all that, uh, when we be out there, the whole place might be gone. And uh, you might only have a small little chunks of it in, a, in North Korea. And uh, then uh, uh, here, we're building one altar here, but that also might be gone. In fact, now we're going to build three altars here and uh, to take in more people. There's an additional extension. So there are some changes that we have made. We're going to do three altars here. And uh, so you can see the world is a different world during the uh, fourth period of seven years. And uh, these are things that we compare. Thank you, Shem. And uh, now we're going to look at some Bible scriptures and see the fulfillment of some of these things that we talk about in the third seven years and in the fourth seven years. Look at the book of Daniel. Some of you may ask, where are these things in the Bible? Uh, some things, of course, you know, the Bible, uh, the Bible will give some information and then there will be other information that are given through vision. And, uh, but one thing is not going against the Bible. It's fulfilling the scriptures. I send out you more details. In the book of Daniel, in the book of Daniel, we know we now know something, so we can relook at it and see the things that take place. In Daniel chapter seven, in Daniel chapter seven, Daniel saw a vision of four beasts. <coughs> And these are the four beasts that he saw in Daniel chapter 7, looking at verse uh, 3. And four great beasts came out from the sea, each different from the other. The first was like a lion and an eagle's wing. I watched till its wings were plucked off. And it was lifted up from the earth and made to stand on two feet like a man. And a man's heart was given to it. And the second... And suddenly another beast, a second like a bear. It was raised up on one side and had three ribs in its mouth between its teeth. And they said thus to it, Arise, devour much flesh. After this I look, there was another like a leopard, which had on its back four wings of a bird. The beast also had four heads and dominion was given to it. After this I saw in the night visions, and behold, a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible, exceedingly strong, it had huge iron teeth. It was devouring, breaking in pieces, and trampling the residue with its feet. It was different from all the beasts that were before it, and it had ten horns. Now, pause for a moment. The first four beasts represent, first beast is the Babylonian Empire. Second beast is the Middle Persian Empire. Third beast is the Greek Empire under Alexander the Great. Fourth beast is the Roman Empire. And so you have the Roman Empire represented in the fourth beast. It was different from all the other empires. Now, the Roman Empire in the end had ten horns. Now, those ten horns are going to take place in our time. And for nearly 2,000 years, Christians have been trying to predict who the ten horns are. And recently, in the 20th century, as the European Union was being formed, people began to say, oh, it's a European Union. And then at first they have 
a couple of countries. Then when they reach 10, some of the scholars of eschatology begin to say, that's it, that's it, that's it. But then it begins to add 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, begin to get about it. Cannot be, what could have been? And uh, so they said, okay, it's part of it, not all of it. And, uh, and it has continued to puzzle scholars. And, uh, and then in the Foundational True Book, Volume 14, uh, I have made several uh, proposals of what the Ten Horns could be. And I, I, I mentioned how the Roman Empire. Uh, take the whole Roman Empire, not just part of it. The whole Roman Empire extends from Europe all the way to Egypt and uh, all the way uh, uh, to, to great parts of, uh, of uh, the Asian continent, uh, at least the, the tea part. Then we realize that it's a large empire and you look at where all the countries are and in the foundational truth, Volume 14, I mentioned that more or less this whole region will be like 10, 10 groups of countries, more or less. And I mentioned uh, the, the possibility of the 10 groups. Then as we come closer to this end time, we realize that however these 10 groups of the Roman Empire and however divided they are, they are primarily led by the European sector group. And of the European sector group, we have mentioned among the seven, seven thunders, that we have managed to identify seven from their mention in the seven thunders. And uh, that these are the, the main leading countries that somehow are involved in these end times. We know for sure England, Germany, France. We know that Italy is involved. We know that Spain is involved because uh, some events revolve around it. And uh, then we also know Greece is involved because it's mentioned in prophecy. And then we realize Turkey is involved because it is also mentioned in prophecy. So with that, we've got seven countries. And uh, by looking at all the recent prophecies, we know that Russia is also involved. Is the king of the north, symbolically speaking. That means eight countries. Two more we have, haven't identified, but might not be that important in our scheme of things because we've got enough now to bring more information here that the ten horns represent the ten uh, influential countries. And definitely, the influence of Rome is there. And uh, as it rises up, it wins against the uh, United States, and then it try goes against Russia. And look at these ten horns now. now. The ten horns are happening in our time. They are happening in our time. And remember, these ten horns rise before the Antichrist. Because the Antichrist is one of the little horns that came later. So we will see all this take place before the rapture and then the seven years tribulation. Because the Antichrist rises in his fullness in a time of the uh, seven years. And so let's read on in chapter 7 of Daniel. The beast had ten horns. It was a, I was considering the horns. And there was another horn. A little one coming up among them. Now, notice here. There were ten plus one little one. That little one represents Russia. And it will in the end be from Russia that the Antichrist will influence the entire world. Alright, so what is happening? is that first the influence is there hidden. And you see here what happened. What, what Daniel saw was this. He was considering the horns. Now how many horns were there? Ten. So he was thinking about these ten horns. 
Look at this ten horns, puzzling about what these ten horns mean. And then there was another horn. That means eleven, correct. So there's an, another one, and that's Russia. Seems to be separate from Europe or part of Europe at the same time. What happened to this little horn? It was a little horn. And uh, coming up among them, before whom three of the first horns were plucked out by the roots. And the little horn conquered three horns. We now know that this refers to the war between Russia, Germany, France, and England. These are the three. I'm giving you the exact interpretation of this. And during the European war, which we have also given the dates, the European war takes place from 2027 and of it most likely to 2029. So it's more or less like a year over a year. Part of the year towards in 227, part of the year in 2029. And uh, we realize that that war takes a year or two to finish. And at first, it is England, France, and Germany leading all of Europe, going against Russia. And in the recent prophecy download, you mentioned two countries, even countries of Norway and all those, were all working there to support the war. If we include those two countries, it will make exactly that. Because these are the financial base. In war, you need money. Without money, you cannot fight a war. And some wars are lost because there's no money to buy food, no money, no money to buy weapons, and no, money, no money to support the soldiers. Money is very important in war. War costs money. War can bankrupt a country. Uh, very, it's very costly to go to war. And those countries, I think you mentioned Norway, Sweden. Norway, Sweden. Uh, all those who rope in to support the war. The war between Europe and Russia was over all the former Soviet Union countries who now Europe want to gather together. There's a spirit that belongs to the devil that wants to unite it all together. It's a great European uh, expansion. And, but Russia will protect, say, hey, these are formerly mine. And then we war fought. And it will last for some time. And now we know what was happening between the little horn and the ten horns. But in the end, that little horn is going to conquer three of the ten. And you know exactly what they are now. England, France, and Germany. And after Russia conquers it, as we mentioned, as Russia is about to conquer, the tsunami takes place. Uh, the tsunami wipes out uh, the whole situation. And wipes out a lot of the world. Millions die. And, and in the midst of war, they all quickly sign treaties. And Russia will begin to increase in power. But as Russia increased in power towards the, uh, towards the end time, the fragile peace uh, takes place in that sector, although other places still have war and turmoil. Africa, about 50 countries, 555 under left 8 countries, and uh, they dominate the continent. So there's, there's a war happening all over the world in that time. And then uh, China continued going strong, Russia continued going strong. But there can only be one. There can only be one. And in the end, they both challenged each other in 2034, but the beginning of the fourth year. And that little horn is going to go stronger and stronger. And then it shows here 
that in verse 8, there in this horn were eyes like the eyes of a man and a mouth speaking pompous words. It tells us that the Antichrist will rule from Russia. And now he could be born anywhere. He most likely, as we know, we have Jewish blood on him and, and all those things. And uh, he and, and the beast will be helping him uh, to uh, and the false prophet and so he will rise from Russia and he will continue to uh, grow and grow and let's look at verse 23 again chapter 7 it says here and uh, okay let's read from verse 20 let's start earlier Chapter 7 of Daniel. And the ten horns that were on his head, and the other horn which came up before, which three fell, namely, that horn which had eyes and a mouth which spoke pompous words, whose appearance was greater than his fellows. I was watching, and the same horn was making war against the saints. Hey, that's you guys here, the church of which you are a part, and some of you say, "Oh, I'm gone already, a first generation." Sorry, you're still around. <laughs> you're still around because we're we are not talking about 2048 here. <laughs> you guys are still around. I'll tell you when we go back to the chat afterward. But let me read scriptures and prevailing against them. Hey, the Bible predicts a period of persecution. We're going to point out when it occurs. Verse 22. Until the ancient of days come, that's Christ our Lord, and a judgment was made in favor of the saints of the Most High, and the time came for the saints to possess the kingdom. That talks about the end time. But before that, verse 23. Thus he said, the fourth beast shall be a fourth kingdom on earth, which shall be different from all the other kingdoms. That's the Roman Empire. And shall devour the whole earth, trample it, and break it in pieces. The ten horns are ten kings, who shall arise from this kingdom. And uh, of course, symbolically, ten kings, because some of those countries don't have kings. But most European countries have kings. The strange thing is that. Most European countries are kings. They are there. Even though their king might, might be a constitutional king, uh, not a theocracy. And uh, says here, and in the time of Daniel, they don't exist as countries yet. And uh, in fact, Enoch mentioned in his conversation uh, with uh, Elijah and, 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 and uh, our prophet, he says he saw all these seven thunders. Except that. Enoch finds it in a strange language. And you think the angelic language is strange. I tell you, Enoch probably can pronounce all the angels' names like that. Because he must have, the ancient language was closer. But English must have been difficult for him. Not now though. I mean, he has kept up to history too. But when he first saw the vision of this world and the seven thunders end time, all this English words are strange sounding names to him. And human concepts like slavery, all that, were not even existing in Enoch's time. So a lot of things are strange to him when he saw it in vision. And so now we know uh, these are ten kingdoms. Now if we add the last two countries that uh, were, were seen, and that was uh, Sweden and Norway, that would have made 10. Because when, when we really look at the seven thunders vision, the 10 pairs of eyes, the 10 tigers, and so remember the color again, it was black tiger gray with gray stripes. Right? Black tiger with gray stripes. There were 10 pairs of eyes, and all were 
located in the European sector. And so more or less, they're all in that sector there. And uh, we realize that these are the 10 kings that rise. Then in verse 24, another shall rise after them. So the Bible even predicts that the European nations will be strong first. And then after that only will Russia be strong. Which is exactly what is taking place as we now know some details of this end time thing. And we are, no, no, we are not guessing at all. This is now different from scholars trying to predict or guess. This is exact interpretation. Combining the Bible with exact visions. And putting all together that uh, what is taking place is that Europe will rise strong led by these 10 countries and the 10 countries are led by the 3 main countries and they will rise strong and they indeed became strong and when they are strong they will wage war against Russia but instead Russia will defeat them and uh, that's when another you see it was written another shall rise after them and he shall be different from the first ones and shall subdue three kings and three nations will be conquered. And he will directly attack France, Germany, and England. And they will have to make peace. He will conquer them. And then from out of Russia, there will be a time, there's a gap between those 24 and 25. And Russia grows stronger and stronger and stronger. And then there will be a gap. During the gap, the Antichrist will rise. Now let's pause in verse 24. Look at the time chart again. To see how old the Antichrist is and how old the beast is. To show you what happened in the fourth seven years. 2034 to 2036 is the war between China and Russia. Last for about two years or so. And uh, the war between them was more each trying to conquer more territories until finally uh, China settles for peace when Russia was coming down against them and winning. When half of Mongolia got conquered, China is going to get, uh, get conquered too. So better sign for peace before they come into your territory. Smart move. And uh, this first chart is the age of the false prophet. This second chart is the age of the Antichrist, assuming the Antichrist is born in 2015. And the false prophet was born, uh, what year did we say he was born? Let's go all the way to the chart again. 2004. 2004. 2004. Okay, thank you. 2004. Ah, yeah. 2004. Earthquake and major tsunami. Birth of the beast. Ah, there you go. Okay. And uh, so you can imagine 2015, you might have some sort of uh, cataclysmic event that takes place in 2015. But let's look down again, back to our little chart. Uh, thank you. Oops. 2034 here. Yeah, yes. So uh, in 2034, in the four seven years, the false prophet is, let's call him the beast, and then the other beast, let's call him Antichrist, uh, to differentiate the false prophet, and uh, he's about 30 years old, Antichrist is about 20 years old. When they go to war, now because these are actually fallen angels who sneak into human uh, embryo and take on human flesh, their intelligence is there even when they are they are small. So don't underestimate their age. They will have the evil wisdom of the fallen angels. You definitely don't want them in your Sunday school. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> no way you can convert them. 
because they are not human spirits at all. They are the evil fallen angels in them. Um, in case some of you thought you know you can convert them, then the world had peace. Sorry, you don't change the Bible. Right? And uh, uh, born again conversion is only for human soul, not for fallen angels. And so uh, the beast is thirty years old, Antichrist about twenty years old. That's when the war erupts. And uh, the Antichrist is uh, during the two years, the age is 30, 32, 20, 22, 10 years difference between them. You know how the war ends? You know how, how at the same time, Russia represents the beast as a, uh, the beastly nation, as the little horn coming up. But there's a real person called the Antichrist who will be influencing Russia. And you know how he gains fame. Okay, just before this, let's look at the end of the third seven years. Okay, there's a fragile piece, 2013-2034. This fragile piece is very important. During this fragile piece, remember, U.S. is gone as a nation. The people began to move northwards to Africa, uh, to Canada, or Canada, or Europe, and some migrate to Russia. Because Russia will be the main economic power together with China. Remember the weather is going to cool, going to warm up. So a great part of those cold areas are going to be warmer with vegetation. And even now, uh, scientifically, they already are measuring that over the past 10 years to 20 years, there are parts of tundra grass that now dying off and replacing with normal uh, 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 temperate climate trees and shrubs. Weather is changing and uh, it's, it's inside a scientific study uh, on the internet. And they actually have pictures of the tundra uh, 10, 10, 20 years ago replaced by shrubs and trees. The weather really is changing and warming up. And uh, <clears throat> during this fragile peace, Russia is going to prosper. And uh, then, even though the Antichrist is 16 to 20 years old from 2003 to 2034, and the beast is 26 to 30 years old, the Antichrist is going to be quite a diplomat. In fact, uh, uh, among his advisors and trainers, Pastor David saw some of them, are military people. He will be mentored by military people, so he no strategies of war. He will be mentored by financial geniuses. So he knows everything about the financial market from young. And so he will be involved in making Russia also more and more recognized. He will, uh, while the beast demonstrate power, the beast will call down fire from heaven. And uh, so one day it will be interesting. We all might be, this is just teasing a bit, we all might be in the stadium watching. On one side, the beast. The other side, seven thunder prophets. <laughs> Round one, ding! <laughs> the rest of all are watching. No, my kids in there could be playing a very fast song. <laughs> <laughs> and then the, the, the beast caught fire. <laughs> and then consume, maybe. One elephant. Sorry, those of you love elephant, okay. Consume one oxen. Then, ding! Next, next turn, seven thunder prophet. Then he called down fire. <laughs> Two oxen burn. <laughs> Run one goes to the seven thunder prophet. Yeah, whatever. <laughs> anyway, there's going to be uh, a conf uh, there's going to be a, 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 a huge a confrontation but it doesn't come yet. But well, one day that's going to happen. The beast will use, uh, uh, he can control supernatural forces. He can control thunder. He can control fire. He can turn rivers. And he will demonstrate signs and wonders. A lot of people will believe. The Antichrist, his power is in his words. His diplomacy. He can solve problems. He can bring 
two peoples who are quarreling all their life together to make peace. Very clever to talk. Very clever to persuade. He will have the gift of negotiation and peacemaking. With his words, he can persuade. And he will be persuading during this time. A lot, because the war is devastating. And a lot of countries are impoverished. And, and uh, Europe is suffering. America is suffering. And the, the beast uh, does his signs and wonders. The Antichrist, during this period, even before the war between China and Russia, will already be persuading a lot of the Europe will be coming under their dominion and will be persuading a lot of the former Soviet Union countries to come back to be part of Russia. And they will expand the Russian Empire. Of course, he will be very famous in Russia. Because, as we all know, once upon a time there was a Soviet Union. You all, if you are alive today, have seen it in your days. Because it's only a few decades away. And the Soviet Union broke up into countries like Uzbekistan, Kazakhstan, Ukraine, and all these uh, huge countries were once a part of the great Soviet Union. The Antichrist is going to sew everything back together. He will be loved by Russia. Because he will bring back the influence of Russia. And he will be instrumental, even as a young fellow, 16, 20 years old. He will be instrumental and gain his fame. And I can tell you, when all the Soviet Union countries come back to the Russian Empire, Russia will say, yeah! And he will be adulated. So he's already famous there. And it becomes more powerful at some point. The war occurred in 2034, the beginning of the fourth seven years. And that's what we are focusing on. At the beginning of fourth seven years, China and Russia goes to war. Fight for two years. You know who brings peace to them? The Antichrist. He is about 20 to 22 years old. He will be the one to persuade Russia, persuade China to be at peace. When the peace treaty is signed, he will be even more powerful. So you can see what is happening here is building his empire. And what is the achievement? What is the devil trying to achieve through the Antichrist? He wants to bring one world empire under him. The objective of our enemy, now we as a church, we must know what your enemy strategy is, correct? You must know what your enemy is trying to do. You cannot fight a war, and we're talking about spiritual war here too, it's not a natural war. You cannot fight a war without knowing what your enemy strategies are. The strategy of the enemy is to once again rule the world. As he ruled the world once, Satan was in rebellion with one third of the fallen angels. As he ruled the world once under Nimrod in the time of Noah, uh, in the time at the Tower of Babel, before in the time of Noah destroyed everything. So he wants to bring the world again. As, as they build the Tower of Babel to unite the world under the wrong power, the Antichrist will try to do that. So he will slowly bring everything under his influence. And he began to see that happening. Towards the end of the third seven years, his influence is coming up. See, he doesn't wait until he's 30 years old. 40 years old, 50 years old, he starts very young. He's a fallen angel inside. And by the four, seven years, he is already doing diplomacy. And he is the one 
that's going to bring peace between China and Russia at the end of the war. Because China, uh, Russia will dominate. And he will be very, very famous. And the beast will, of course, do the signs and wonders and, and get everyone to agree to everything that he's doing because they are working for each other even though they haven't, they might not have met yet. According to the vision, they haven't met each other yet, but they know about each other. They're going to meet soon. Down, down here sometime as we cover this series of the rapture. Uh, what happens in 2034 is about 2020. At the end of this war, in 2034 to 2041, which is exactly the period of the seven years, the world is aligned between Russia and China. Now, once peace comes between China and Russia, the world will be at peace again. Once the world is at peace, here's a question I ask you. We're talking about world in uh, the world in 2036 onwards. What will be happening and what will the Antichrist and all that be doing? During this time, and then we, we bring it upwards. 2036, the Antichrist was instrumental in bringing peace between China and Russia. H22, B32. 2013, 2014. A period of calm come upon the world, except in the Middle East. Middle East take a little bit of war and turbulence. And a uh, period of calm. Uh, and then Greece and Turkey were at war, while the Middle East was turbulent. But during this period, the uh, beast continued to gain. The beast by that time now grew to 32, 35 years old. And decreased 22 to 25 years old. And remember that this fourth period of seven years is very important. By the end of this period, the beast has reached its fullness and so has the Antichrist. So it's in the fourth period that they are building their influence in the world. They will bring Russia and China together, bring Europe together, and uh, then uh, they will be increasing their influence. They're still working in the background. And uh, of course, the church will continue to grow. By that time, you have seen the tsunami. By that time, the whole world will know uh, where the true church is. By that time, uh, when you look at the map, you realize that these things are going on. Then you realize it's preparing for a period of the fifth seven years. Remember we talk about uh, uh, the fifth seven years and it says here where God allows the Antichrist and the horn to persecute the Christians. You know when that takes place? Fifth set of seven years. 2041 to 2048. And 2048, our prophet goes home. So in the last seven years before the prophet goes home, is persecution. Because he got the, he, you can say, you know, uh, you know the song, he's got the whole world in his hands, he's got the whole world in his hands, he's got the whole world in his hands, but wrong hands. <laughs> the Antichrist got the whole world in his hands. And while he's busy in the third phase of seven years, in the fourth phase of seven years, he's still being kept busy, didn't pay too much attention to the church. By the fifth phase, he got everything. At the end of the fourth phase, the end of the fourth set of seven years in 2014, it says here, Satan had a conference near Pergamos, which prepared the way for the rise of the beast and the Antichrist. 
and strategies against the church. That is when they will start attacking the church. But under that, they're too busy. Of course, that doesn't mean that they're not targeting, they're not targeting, they're targeting them, but they got a lot of their objectives not achieved yet. They haven't achieved their objectives. And how many people were, of you will live during this fifth set of seven years? First generation, second generation, third generation. So, most of you will be alive. <laughs> Congratulations! <laughs> Congratulations! And now, uh, you will die during this persecution life. However, the persecution cannot touch the areas of refuge. When you enter those regions of refuge, the angels are all guarding. Cannot penetrate. Because small, small demons that you know people in the, the world is not perfect. Small, small demons and, and all that that, that oppress people or cause them to sin or all, all those will always be there. But the major attack cannot cross the line. Cannot cross the line. Now you know how important the regions of refuge are. Very important. And then when you look at things decades down the line, work backwards. Now you know how important the building altars are. The prayer walks are. You are establishing things in the spirit. Because when we finish building the altar in Australia and New Zealand, the angels were all parked around the borders. A line was drawn. Very important. As we go towards Seoul, because there's going to be another great church build that uh, I mean Korea the soul might be gone only the upper part and, and China and uh, where is part and why America when it's going to uh, fall because there's still going to be one more revival we have a lot of churches on the eastern state and uh, we will be planting I'll be personally involved in planting 10 major churches around the world Smallest one will be 10,000 in size. Biggest one will be millions of members. And then our disciples that we train will go forth to plant the other 9,990 churches. To make 10,000 churches. Our COG angel uh, Actually, he's also an archangel. Has ten generals. It's a different category. He got ten generals, and that's why ten major churches. One of the major church is here in your little country. You have one general even when we travel the world, and uh, then the ten generals are spread out among the continents. But what happened is. After the tsunami, four of the generals will be relieved because the churches will have disappeared. Not underwater. Evacuated. And no more country. And then the four generals will be reassigned to the travelling groups. And the travelling groups we will have several hundred thousand and uh, some of them would first gen some of them first generation some of them second generation, third generation but by the end time will be a specialized 4,000 and some of you are already among the 4,000 and by that time towards the end you're all the way young hopefully you keep the anointing of God and you still look very young. If the anointing of God not so strong, some of you might look very old. So, hold fast to the anointing of God. And uh, 
then the amount of 4,000. So that by the time you're 70 or 80, uh, you will still be like Joshua and Caleb, still like in your 30s, strong in the Lord. And so, all these things are taking place, and now you know the areas of refuge as we look forward, uh, that we have to prepare for this period of persecution. It's already there. It's predicted in Daniel chapter 7, verse 21. The same horn was making war against the saints and prevailing against them. And uh, in fact, verse 25 of chapter 7 says, He shall speak pompous words against the Most High, shall persecute the saints of the Most High, shall intend to change times and law, and the saints shall be given into his hand. But the worst part is, in verse 25, for a time, times, and half a time, the worst part is during the tribulation part. But there is a part in verse 25 that during the tribulation, the seven years, then there is a part before the tribulation. And the part before the tribulation, this period here. This is where the beast will be challenging the prophet and the apostle. Because the fivefold will be there. So it's important to see, you know, by that time, the uh, Antichrist 28, uh, in 2041, uh, the beast is 38 years old. So these are things in our future as we look at uh, all these uh, predictions. And today we have covered the fourth period of seven years, from so 2034 right to 2040, and uh, 2034, 2041, the alignment of the world, and we mentioned some of those things that are taking place and the importance of what we have to do. Looking forward at so many decades, we bring ourselves here to the present. What must we do? You saw the persecution in the fifth set of seven years. You saw the war in the third set of seven years. You saw the work that needs to be done in the fourth set of seven years. So all those things that need to take place. And uh, in fact, uh, Pastor David saw himself after the tsunami going to countries and uh, realigning again, going through the same countries, uh, praying through and, uh, and, and, and and releasing prophecies to hold back some things and draw boundaries and lines. So what is happening in the prophetic walk? What is happening in the altar building? What is happening in this prayer walk? Between the second phase that is going to be completed over the next few months and the third phase completed, things are still fluid in the spiritual dimension. A lot of prayers and intercessions. There are some things that are dry cement. You can't negotiate with God. They are sealed and settled. When God says something in judgment, that's it. Don't try, try to be funny with God. When God says these uh, things are aligned this way, you cannot prevent a tsunami. You cannot prevent the meteorites. Don't you dare pray against those things. And those of you who hear these things uh, and pass it on to someone, please cross-reference back to us in case someone take it out of context or add something that should not be added and they don't have the whole picture very dangerous a little knowledge is a dangerous thing you either understand fully and use it and don't use bits and pieces it's like playing with gunpowder and uh, so it's important to understand uh, all that God is bringing forth but what are we to do? And how do we respond in this time? There are some things that are dry cement already. But there are some things that are still wet cement. And let me explain some of these things and the principles that are involved. First, as we come to it, as we look at phase 2 and phase 3, is what I call the principle of preparation. 
Let's look at the book of uh, Exodus. Exodus. The altar building may look very simple. Now, not all of you might be involved in the altar building and you will still have the blessings. But those who are assigned to be part of the altar building, you have to prepare yourselves. And some of you might be assigned different tasks, even back home, locally. Like, uh, I know Eddie, you cannot make it for all the altar building. You don't have enough leave first day. And it's not time to resign your job yet. <laughs> I have enough. So, uh, you get to pray and see which one God wants you to be in. And uh, then, uh, but you have your job to do. When you do your job faithfully here, also there is some blessings imparted. So when I talk about preparation, I'm not talking about, I'm talking about those who go altar building, those who stay back praying, those who have different assignments. Every one of you has something to do. God is watching your life. All your response in different things. In the book of Exodus, as they were getting ready to meet with God, in chapter 19, verse 11, God says, verse 10 and 11, the Lord said to Moses, Go to the people, consecrate them today, and tomorrow, let them wash their clothes. Let them be ready for the third day. For on the third day, the Lord will come down upon Mount Sinai in the sight of all the people. So the Lord says, consecrate themselves for three days. And in verse 14, Moses went down from the mountain to the people, sanctified the people, and they washed their clothes. Then in verse 15, he says, be ready for the third day. Do not come near your wives. They are married people in the midst. Uh, these are the people who came up from the from the Egypt. Three days. They will not allow sexual relationship. They will not allow to do normal thing. Nothing wrong with sexual relationship between husband and wife. But what God was calling was a higher level. God was saying, in your time of preparation, it is above normal. Normal, the Bible tells you that the marriage bed is sanctified, is undefiled. It has nothing to do with sin. It has to do with you are about to meet God face to face. God said, can you prepare extra than your normal preparation? Can you readjust your schedule? Don't make it a normal schedule. You have to, you have to prepare like, okay, this is a once in a lifetime day. How are you going to prepare? If you knew that what is going to happen tomorrow when you have a talk, let's say, with an angel or with a prophet or with me together, and you knew that whatever we pray for you at that point is going to be permanent for the rest of your life. How will you prepare? That is the attitude. And let me tell you tonight, the Lord already showed me some people who have missed out some things. The Lord took me in the spirit and point them. This one has failed. This one has failed. This one has failed. This one has failed. This one has passed. This one succeed. This one has failed. This one has succeed. This one has passed seventy uh, percent. This one passed fifty percent. This one passed seventy percent. This one passed eighty percent. See, the Lord shows a prophet some things, but the Lord shows me some things. We all have different callings, different things to do. And some of the things the Lord showed have become dry semen. The Lord told the Lord told me this person has missed taking this part of the anointing. It shall not be given to somebody else. And then the Lord tells me 
This one is faithful. Yes, he has been faithful and taken everything I've given. I will give more. But for some things, it is still wet cement. It's still not too late for some of you. Because some of you have already missed. I'm talking about not just those of you here, those of you online, those of you in Australia. You've seen your spirits. And the Lord says, I have called them to meet with me. I have told them that this is the time for them to meet with me. And they have not prepared their spirits and themselves. Thus, I cannot give this to them. Because they are not ready. Angels have shown up in this three day fast. Remember I thought about absorbing a year's rock three day, three day fast. In the three day fast, on the third day of Ayers Rock, I was called to the conference with the angels. Since I came back for three day fast, angels had kept coming, reporting, and in conference with them, say, and because my job is to ensure that the kingdom of God comes on earth. That's my assignment. It's a heavy task, cannot be done without Jesus. And angels have stood and said, What shall we do? Because if this person fails 20%, their failure of 20% is going to affect this person, this person, this person, this person. Down the line, I see all the way through down the line for the next four generations. And that 20%, if not taken, has to be taken and given somewhere. Because you cannot hold back the next generation that depend on that one. But the timeline, some cement is wet and slowly drying. And you have only one chance to get it right. People have not prepared themselves. Some of the things of God. When you were told, okay, there's an impartation, or you're told that it's an important time, things, simple things like, okay, you're about to be delivered your angel's name. Hey, don't take it, take things lightly. Or when you're about to go forth and do something, whether it be building an altar. Or what it be? Don't take it lightly. We humans tend to take things lightly, and sometimes familiarity breeds contempt. So that Nadab and Abihu, who serve God in the priesthood, they got so used to serving God in the priesthood, they take things lightly, they were killed by the fire. They die. They thought any fire will do. They die. So, preparation. And the preparation that is important is for us to be willing to say, Lord, this is the time of the first, second, third phase. Now second and third phase already. We must bring ourselves to it. During the first phase I mentioned, There were 24 people who were supposed to be there. 24, 22 I brought back some blessing to the other two. Out of love and compassion. Small little human decision go a long way. One day when we stand before the judgment seat, 
people will understand the precision of what God wants to do or don't you want to do. Looks like a human decision, but a human decision that could miss an entire destiny. In the second phrase, not all of you will be involved in the third phrase. Not all of you are involved in different parts of the second phrase. But every one of you are involved in COG. COG Church has a destiny. Even a simple decision by Kenneth just to visit. This visit has cemented your destiny in China. If you did not visit, and you were led by God to visit. If you did not listen to that, you would have missed that angel. And he would have been assigned to someone else. Such a simple decision, his whole destiny has changed. Preparation. In what God asks you to do. And young people, understand that. Preparation. What is God speaking? Now I know not all of you might see open visions. Not all of you might have spiritual encounters. I might not have open vision, but I do see visions. Encounter the spiritual dimension. And I know what I heard. And Every one of you in the second phase and third phase are going to encounter God in some way. Some of you are already experiencing some encounters. As you prepare yourself and set yourself aside, your destiny is now being cemented. It's the preparation that is important. Not all of us might have the physical strength to walk in some of these places. Like, like Ruby, you might not be able to go walk some of these tough walk. But I've given you a job to do. The job of intercession. But by giving her the job, her doing the job involves a blessing. Simple things. Little things. Only God knows what's in your heart. Is important. Now, there were five prophets that were being chosen. One in China, one in Malaysia, one in Singapore, two in Australia. The one in China died. One in Malaysia died. Singapore still kicking and alive. <laughs> and being obedient to God became a seven thunders prophet. There are two in Australia still alive. You know where they are now. They have failed several tests. That's why there is no connection made. If they had listened to God, and hopefully there's still a chance for them to turn around until things are sealed in the third phase. What God is speaking, the desires of our heart, whatever you hunger for God, remember, the preparation. And look at the preparation in the book of Exodus. It was beyond normal. God is not asking that the men and women stay, the men stay away from their wives permanently. That would be wrong. God was just saying, you're about to meet me for three days. I want you to do something special. Consecrate yourself extra more. Now, don't after this sermon, after that, you know, you make some wrong decisions and one month later, I hear from your spouse. <laughs> he says, you do your sermon, yes? What happened? They're consecrating themselves for 12 months. I cannot talk. <clears throat> That's a bit too much. And generally, you consecrate yourself over these two years. But if there's something special like an encounter with God, an 
impartation, a job that God has give yourself. That's why now nowadays we require three day fast minimum for those going to build altars. And the Canada one, seven day fast. And if whoever participate it, don't participate with the right heart, taking things lightly, so will their blessings also be minimized. This is the time when destinies are being written on the mere hitting of arrows to the ground. Remember the parable. Second Kings 13. Elisha was dying. And the king was, Israel was told, shoot the arrow. And he says, the arrow of the deliverance of the Lord against the Syria. They said, take the arrows and hit it to the ground. And he hit three times. The man of God was angry. He said, you should have knocked under the arrows are destroyed. Then you will destroy the Syrian. Instead, you will only hit them three times. How does it correlate? How can a simple act of hitting arrows cement the destiny of the future of his whole country? Such is the anointing of God. Simple decision. Simple decision that you make. Seal your destiny. Which is why, you know, it's important for us to make the right decisions in this two-year period. Take it easy a bit. It can mean chop, 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 chop. From 10 talent level only two. <laughs> wow. Wow. After this sermon, everyone, <laughs> don't get too tense. Relax. But not too relaxed. <laughs> It's not you who do it. It's Jesus in you. But the only thing... See, it's not your strength even. The only thing God wants you to have is respect God. Whenever God's going to do something... Now, you might not like the instruments. But if God is working through whatever it's through, respect that God is behind it. Respect God. And how you encounter the Lord will be the mercies of the Lord until the closing time. And I tell you, at the end of phase 3, when it closes, it really closes. Something is sealed and cannot be undone anymore. <coughs> Very critical time. First thing is, Preparation. People don't know how to prepare. And they take it like ordinary, like this is ordinary. And as a result, they lost some things. Second thing, and uh, people don't know how to receive. They don't know how to receive when God has given them something. Don't know how to absorb it in. As a result of that, you might lose what you receive. In the book of uh, Mark chapter 4, there were four types of ground. When the seed was sown, there were four types of ground. And this is what happened to the first ground in verse 15. So was so the word in verse 14 and then in verse 15. The ones by the wayside, they hear, but Satan comes immediately and takes the word that is so. Verse 16, the second type of ground, stony ground. They hear, immediately receive, have gladness, even rejoice, but no root in themselves, and give only for a time and lose it all. The third type of ground, they receive it in verse 18, but in verse 19, the cares of this world, the deceitfulness of riches, they try to turn the anointing into money. Merchandise anointing. 
Twist the anointing for your own end. Twist the anointing to your own ego. Twist the anointing for money. Twist the anointing for fame. Twist the anointing to manipulate people. This ground. The deceitfulness of riches, influence, and holiness. Cares of this world. Desires for other things that are not in line with God's word. Choke the word. And the last time on ground, verse 20. They hear the word, accept it, they bear fruit, 30 fold, 60 fold, 100 fold. Even that got three different levels. Let me tell you about this second point. Where the Lord shows me. People don't know how to receive, don't know how to absorb. Okay, let's analyze the ground that failed. The first ground failed. How did the devil steal the word? How dare the devil steal the word? I'll tell you how he steal. He creates doubts. And doubts accumulate creates unbelief. And unbelief in your mind drops into your heart, become heart unbelief. You end up totally rejecting what God gave. Thus nullifying, cancelling everything that you receive. So how is it that people don't know how to receive? In point 2a, they doubt. If unbelief. It's okay to inquire to learn. It's in okay to be inquisitive, wanting to learn more. It's okay to ask questions. It's okay to critic to try to understand how it applies. Only God knows what's going on in your heart. But when there is genuine doubt, it cancels everything. It's like you never got it in the first place, correct? After the devil take it away, it's like they never got it in the first place. That's horrible now. Now you notice that everything that God showed so far, we have been absorbing, absorbing and believing. When, when we share all this thing, I share it without a shadow of a doubt. I determined long ago that Shama was a true archangel. I determined long ago what is true, what is false. I have determined long ago what God is doing and accepted what God is doing. And when God shows something, there's no doubt. No place for doubt. There's a time when a time of doubting cannot exist anymore. You've gone past that. Some of you might not doubt some of these revelations. But some of you doubt what God said about your life. Is it, isn't it quite hard to believe sometimes? Like God says, oh this angel is for you. And this is the history of your angel. This is what God says you can do. This is what God says he will do. This is what God showed in the vision that you must do. And then you say, I don't believe it, finish. Your mouth says it. At first, you believe. Your mouth starts talking wrong things. Your mind starts doubting. You keep it that way for the next few months. And Satan will come and steal it. And you will like, you never receive it in the first place. So problem number two was people don't know how to receive when you receive something, you don't give place to doubt. When you know that it is of God, there's no place for doubting. Do you know that doubt nearly caused Peter to drown while he walked on the water? He was walking okay until he doubted. There are many things he could doubt. One thing he says, hey, how can this be? When he saw the waves, the doubt, I believe, was not so much about Jesus. The story is found in Matthew 14. At first, 
Jesus, before he stepped into the water, the disciples were thinking, hey, who is this figure coming? I assume Jesus was very nice color white. Then they see this white figure floating on the water. Say, so where did the sound come from? Not from Jesus. From the wind, of course. Because it was windy that day. And in the boat, this white figure, and you know, there's no human that has gone on the water. And there's these waves that roll and the wind that go, and you know when you're in the sea there, the wind can go. Ooh. And then you've this white figure coming near it, you're like. Ooh. And then the disciples say, Ghost! Ghost! If they were in Malaysia, they say, Putiada! Hantu! The young people with too much. Modern movie. Vampire! <laughs> and then Jesus had to say, It is I! This thing had to figure out, Shall we believe this voice? Peter believed the voice and he stepped into the water. Said, Lord, if that is you, call me to come. And everybody was looking at Peter. Looking at a figure, there. wondering what Peter is doing. Thomas might be holding on to him. Don't shout, please, brother. We still want to see you tomorrow. <laughs> but the voice came rolling across the water. Come! And Peter stepped out. And he was walking on water towards that white figure. And then for a moment, the waves were coming at him. <laughs> and then the waves were coming. And Peter turned to look at the waves. What was going on in his mind? He must have doubted something. I don't think he doubted that figure. How do you know? Because he did call for help. Say, Lord, help! If he didn't believe the Lord, how can he call him for help? He still believed the Lord. Right? So I don't think that he didn't believe the Lord. Because the Bible says in Matthew 40, his eyes were looking at the waves. You know what his doubt was? He did not doubt the Lord. See, many people think he doubted the Lord. Because if he doubted the Lord as he's drowning, he will say, he won't call to the Lord, he'll call to his companion. Hey, bring the boat to me! Oh, bring the boat to me! <laughs> right? Instead, he's calling the other side, Lord, help! Right? He could call this side or that side. So he didn't doubt that it was the Lord. His doubt was, this is not humanly possible. Right? That was the doubt. The doubt was, this cannot be done. The law of fishermen says no fisherman can be on the water walking. The law of physics, the law, whatever law there is that tells you a human cannot walk on water. The doubt was that it was naturally impossible. Not that that was not the Lord. Because the moment he said, Lord help! The Lord was straight away coming to him, correct? And he's drowning. The waters was too strong. But still he managed to squeeze out a scream. Very short prayer. No time for long prayers. <laughs> The prayer was two words long. Although tonight we got all night prayer, it's the sincerity of your heart and the depth of your faith. Two words long prayer. And two words long cannot fit the whole loss of Lord's prayer inside. Because on the second line you have been drowned.
Oh Father who art in heaven, hello. <coughs> <laughs> Second one, you have been drowned. The waves were very strong that day. You never even give not enough space for the gift, uh, the, the daily bread or the deliver the evil part. No time. The rest of the prayer will be inside there, drinking water. And as he called out, Lord help! Who should he see coming but the white figure coming nearer? And he didn't say, hey, not you, not you, him. Obviously, he had faith that this was the Lord. And the Lord grabbed him. His doubt was, it was humanly impossible. Everything in his mind, everything in his knowledge, everything of whatever science or knowledge that they had of mathematics tells them, it was impossible for humans to walk on water. And that is where some of you fail. You see the word of God tell you something. You see natural things tell you something. I didn't say you doubt Jesus. But you doubt the word about your life. If the word was declared in a vision, a dream, a prophecy, the moment you doubt it, you reject it, it cannot be part of you. And here is my encouragement to you. What harm does it do for you to believe great things? Let's say if you believe God for 10 million souls and you want 1 million, isn't it better than you believe it can only be 100 souls and 100 souls? What harm does it do to you to believe great things in God? It only builds your faith. You say, oh, you know, you, you must set, set your, you know, your figures uh, uh, real and all this. Look at it this way. Even if you set it so great, you don't achieve it, somebody will achieve it because you have believed it for it. This is talking about prayer. <clears throat> Believing for good things. And that is where some people don't know how to receive. You are receiving miraculous prophecies. I have no doubt about some of the things that are prophesied and spoken. As I mentioned, there were four things our angel Raphael gave to me in Mukabe in August. I write them down, list them down every day. Thank you, Lord. I don't doubt those things. Whatever God else God revealed, what has God spoken about your life? What God tells you that you will do? If you doubt it, you might lose it at the end of the third phase and it goes to someone else. Because it cannot stick to you. The word cannot be sown into you. But God's word still needs to be done. The job He gives you, you don't want to do, somebody will to do the job. The second type of soil is a little different. This soil receive, and you compare the, because this parable is not only found in Mark, it's also found in Matthew, also found in Luke. This second ground actually rejoice, live for joy, have gladness. But they say, only endure for a while. Only endure for a while. What cannot they endure? In verse 17, persecution. They cannot stand things that go against what the word say. What is persecution? Look at chapter 4 of Mark, verse 17. Persecution arises for the word's sake. In other words, 
after they got the word, life became worse. Because the persecution was against the word. If the word was not there, they won't have the persecution. They were challenges to the prophecies. Challenges to what God said. And they cannot stand the test. Remember I said there, are, there is a test before you receive. There is a test after you receive. This is the test after you receive. To see whether it really sticks to you. How much do you really believe and want what you want? And persecution comes, you say, this is the last thing you ever give up. And you're holding on to it. There's no way they can take it out of your hand because you're holding tight to it. Even they shoot an arrow through your heart, you still die holding it. They chop your hand off, your hand will be there holding it. And God will have to piece back your hand together. God will heal your heart and resurrect your life. Because you're not going to let go of the word. You're not going to let Satan steal that word from you. Satan and the plastic trees and business are stealing. Are you able to pay the price for the promises and the word God gave? One of the first things that God spoke to us through the angel was when we asked for 50 million in the Exodus, there's a price to be paid. Straight away. Straight away, we should be ready to pay the price. The first thing I immediately say, let's fast seven days. So it's important when God imparts something, God gives something, absorb it properly. Be diligent. And you're prepared to endure challenges against it. And Satan is very smart. He figure out his attack at a prime time before it can really take root. Because after it takes root, you will already have some endurance to go against, to stand the persecution. So before it has a chance to actually get roots into you, we start shaking it out from you. And that's why to be some people cannot stand hardship or persecution or challenges. 2A is they doubt. They doubt because it's against natural. It looks impossible. 2B is hardship, endurance. They don't have the stamina. To endure and pay the price for whatever God has. So they lose what God gave. Third, Distractions. Distractions, three types of distraction. To engross in this world. Attracted by the profits that are in this world. Fame. Or the desires become ungodly. Twist and turn. God showed me. God showed me person and said, I've asked this person, I've spoken to this person, I've reminded this person, and these are the times I reminded them. One, two, three, four. These are when I told this person to do this. One, two, three, four. These are when the person is supposed to do this. One, two, three. This is when I say, this person did not fulfill. From this day onward, the person will have this anointing chop. And I think I was shocked. God, what what can we do? What about this percentage? How will it affect other people? And we had a conference with the angels and in the end, you know, it's been given. And for this person it is. Some parts are dry. Some parts are still wet. 
about dry. But the one thing God says I'm not allowed to do, I cannot tell this person. Because by telling, I spoil this person's ability to hear from God. And God says, I really spoken enough to the word to remind them. And this particular person, the Lord says, verse 19, caught up in the cares. So chop. And if this person doesn't take care, by the end of that phase, it is sealed. Your destiny has been rearranged and changed. The nearest times we are living in. So the second major point to see is distraction. Second major point too is this. People don't know how to receive. Point one, people don't know how to prepare. They talk preparation in normal, no, chin chai, chin chai. If tomorrow you're going to meet the President of the United States, the Queen of England, Prime Minister of Australia, Prime Minister of Singapore, and top it off the young reporter Agong of Malaysia. <laughs> How will you prepare yourself? Will you just, you know, get up in the morning? And just say, oh, today's the day. And then put on your slippers and wear your pajamas to visit. Like any normal day. Of course not. You will prepare the night before. It's important. People don't know how to prepare. People don't know how to receive. And that's why I recommend Absorb it properly. You know, some of you, you receive some anointings and all that. Your angel's name. You know, after receiving angel's name, you know, you receive your angel's name at 9.30. Then you go and watch the show at 10 a.m. Just half an hour before. You just receive anointing. 10 a.m. You go and watch. When buyers are back. <laughs> <laughs> the show finished at 11.30, let's say one half hour show. Then you go and watch Dracula Resurrect. <laughs> the whole day fill yourself with movies. How are you going to absorb? Don't you have enough respect for the gift you receive to at least give yourself one day without all this distraction? To absorb. That's why people take the things of God lightly. And they lose what they receive. Cannot absorb properly. Mind you, the third type of ground, actually, it was growing. But the growth is horrible. The plant is twisted. Cannot properly produce fruit. No fruit at all. You can see the plant, but no fruit. That is what we can of the third type of ground. People don't know how to receive. You must learn to receive. And even learning to receive a different capacity. Some are 34, some 64, some 104. That one, the Bible didn't tell you much about how to differentiate them. But let me share with you the difference between 34, 64, and 104. 104 are those who go the second mile. Extra. 64 are those who... Yeah. Okay, I'll take it. And they do that. They, they do exactly as it is. Why? Because there are three comparisons only. So in when you have three comparisons, you always have the middle as the mean. The last one as the greatest, and the first one as just, just okay. So the 64 represent, yes, you take it as it, but you don't go extra. You 
you don't have extra to do the extra part to really absorb. Simple things. Okay, let's say, I say simple things like, uh, those are you going to sow. Remember what the man of God asked you to do, the prophet. Memorize Isaiah chapter 1, verse 25, 26, and 27. I tell you, if I put a test right now, those of you going, see whether you have memorized. I wonder how many of you will fail. Yes, man, I'm good. It, there wasn't it three verses, right? You did, you, you did ask us to memorize it. Two or three. 25, 26. 27, it's not come that extra. Boy, uh. <laughs> well, yeah, I said memorize three, memorize three. He asks you to memorize. What are the three verses? Isaiah chapter 1, verse 25. I will turn my hand against you. I will thoroughly remove the dross and take away your alloy. Verse 26. I will restore your judges as at the first. And your counselors as at the beginning. Afterward, you shall be called the city of righteousness, the faithful city. Verse 27 talks about Zion, justice, and the penitent having righteousness. Small little things, you just do it because somebody asks you part of the trip. Remember, small things, big things, just do it. And why? Because so is judgment. That's why we were asked to just meditate on those verses. And whether it be big or small, it is important to pursue things in God. The hundredfold goes extra. The sixtyfold, okay, I'll do this. No initiative, just do. It's actually okay. Could, you know, could add a little bit more. The thirtyfold, this isn't enough, I don't have to do all those things. You reinterpret the instruction. So I give illustration. Let's say you ask to memorize the words. Three verses. I mean. They say, ah, maybe what you want to remember is just the meaning. And you reinterpret the instruction. That's the 34. Still do, but. You reinterpret to make it easy for you. So what kind? Are you 34, 64, 100? It's important for us to pursue God. Do all that God has. People don't know how to answer. Last thing that I look at in God's interpret in impartation in the second phase and in the third phase. And uh, we, we leave it, and we bring that point out, but we leave it as it is, to encourage you to press further into God. Something that you already know. Something that we repeated many times, maybe not a thousand times here. And that is, all through the Bible, before there is a revival, there is fasting and prayer. After the revival, also fasting and prayer. You see that in the book of Acts. And it's in fasting and prayer that the apostolic journey began in Acts 13. But let me take to the one in the book of Joel. 
in the book of Joel, we all see the promise of the outpouring in chapter 2 that is quoted in the book of Acts. And in the book of Acts chapter 2, the quotation is taken from verse 28, 29. Where it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh, your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams, your young men shall see vision. And also my men servants and all my maid servants, I will pour out my spirit in those days. I will show wonders in the heavens and in the earth, blood and fire and pillars of smoke. But notice the first part in verse 28. It shall come to pass afterward. What is afterward? Why afterward? What was before the afterward? Before the afterward was the call to fast in verse 1. Blow the trumpet, sound an alarm, for the day of the Lord is coming. And he says in verse 12, Turn to me with all your heart, with fasting, with weeping, with mourning. Verse 15, Blow the trumpet in Zion, consecrate a fast, call a sacred assembly, gather the people. And all this is the call and the promises to the call. Then he says, verse 28, Afterward, I will pour out my spirit. Why did God become so systematic that God, the first few downloads are the Old Testament download, panorama, New Testament panorama, then all the other downloads, and then the seven downloads, and then all the, why the progression? We are supposed to learn from the Old Testament as a pattern. Learn the New Testament, the life of Jesus. And you find one thing that is common. The words of the archangel Shama rings loud and clear. Prayer and fasting is the key to everything. All things natural and spiritual. And praise God for those of you seeking God in fasting and prayer. And in the third area, I would say, fasting, prayer, consecration. It's always important. And what could the third point be? Holiness. Fasting is a way of humbling ourselves before God and calling upon God's holiness and grace. Because we can never achieve what God wants us to achieve without holiness. And we can never be holy by our own means and strength. The only way we can meet face to face with God is God imputes His holiness upon us. I'm not talking about righteousness, which is a gift. I'm talking about holiness, which is an act. Based on the gift, you. Based on receiving the gift of righteousness, you consecrate yourself in holiness. Holiness is a response that we bring to God. As we say, holiness is ownership by God. Then you must surrender. If I don't surrender, God cannot own me. God cannot force me to surrender. God will resist the proud. But surrender must come from our heart. Which is why the place of surrenderedness and humility Fasting and prayer. Seek God. Pray. And, and I don't mean that all oh, you need to go to the extreme fast. You go according to your fast. Even some of the most simple fast. I've seen God accept simple fast by some of you younger ones. I've seen some of your children. You know, I see their fast was so easy. And some of your fast is my normal life. Some of you eat five meals. So you're fast, eat only one meal. I look at you, I say, hey, that's my normal life, I'm only eating one meal. So, you know, it looks easy, but of course God knows. God knows that for you, you eat five meals, now you only eat one meal, it's a great cause. 
God doesn't measure you based on meat. Finish. You got measure you based on meat. And uh, God measure, hey, you're fast, you're not really fast. Finish. Your fast is your fast because you did sacrifice something. And so sometimes I see some of your uh, the fast, you know, your, your children are done, the kids, and I say, what? Oh, so busy, you can stay here. And, but then, it meant a lot to God. It was, it was like the turning of day, uh, night to day. Because God sees your heart in seeking Him. So you don't have to go to the extreme. You go as the Spirit leads you. But every little effort to say, I love you, Lord. I yield to you. Consecrate myself to you. Means a lot to God. And of course, by all of you being here in all night, you're sacrificing sleep. You're fasting your sleep. And so when you come for all night, with the exception of those of you younger ones or those learning the all night prayer, and, uh, and, and you're learning, you pray, 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 then fall asleep. Pray, 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 fall asleep. Pray, 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 fall asleep. But those of you who really want to learn and master, don't look at me and say, I get the way I am by accident. When young also pray, 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 fall asleep. But sometimes I have to fight sleep. And don't think we always get a nap. There are many nights when I just come uh, working as hard as any more you work 9 to 5. Without any sleep. Sometimes even an entire day before without sleep. My body wants to sleep. But sometimes, sometimes you see that sometimes I'm nodding. I force myself to walk. Why? Because very hard to fall asleep while you're walking. Of course, some people do work. Uh, so the walking is all easy. <laughs> and they sleep walking. And they even sleep praying. <laughs> well, that must have been very comfortable. Why? Because when they got up, they are very refreshed. <laughs> and they pray all night. If anyone you had uh, such ability, a lot of people would love to have that. Anyway, but you do f make some effort. You do want to pray. And that is why all night is special. And then you fast before all night. Wow. Double. Double. Uh, zeal. And uh, it's tremendous what we can yield to God. And remember, it's not by our effort. You're doing it because this is your way of saying, God, this is my way of saying I love you and how much I want you. And so, in the third point, we we'll say that fasting and prayer are very important. Still. And it will always be important throughout the rest of the decades. And we see all those things happening fasting and prayer. Remember, it is the key to all things. You never before have a promise and some action that cover everything. What fasting and prayer does. So it's important to absorb, to press in. Fasting and pray, God. Praise God. Let's all rise together as we go into God. And whatever few hours we have in God and we see how God leads in the morning. Each of you have received different impartation, different things in God. The angel's name has been given to you, some the week before, some the week before, the week before. And uh, some of you, uh, don't, don't worry, those of you who have not received your angel's name, just keep pushing strong in God. Because in the weeks to come, you know, your turn will come up. And, uh, and, and every one of you will have your blessing. Even by coming here, being faithful, being serving in various ways and, and, and regular, God's going to honor that. Yeah. Sometimes humans don't know this. Sometimes leaders also don't notice. But God notices. The angels notice. And you're doing it as unto God. So let's see God with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength. Let's reach out unto God, even right now. Father, you hear our prayers. 
And today we ask, O oh God, that you teach us as we see this end times. Teach us to prepare ourselves before we do something in your name or for you. Teach us to receive and absorb that which you give to us. And teach us, O oh God, to live a life of surrender and fasting and prayer until Jesus comes again. Teach us to live a surrendered life, a life full of zeal and surrender to you. We do not ask for a mediocre life because Jesus didn't live a mediocre life. Jesus gave us his best and tonight we give you our best. We know, Father, that overnight prayer existed even in Jesus' time. Our Master and Lord prayed all night, so many countless times. Teach us to pray like Jesus. Teach us to wait on you, Father, as Jesus waited on you. Teach us to gain the strength of your Spirit, to pray true like Jesus prayed true. Oh, how many times did Jesus cry while he was on earth? How many times did he cry in great tears? Oh, Father, teach us to pray like Jesus prayed. And let this anointing seal upon each one of our lives. In Jesus' name, Amen. <laughs> Let's slowly soften the light as uh, we, slow, we sing the song, He is Lord. He is Lord. He is Lord. He is risen from the dead, and He is love. Every knee.